Okay, uh, well, thank you all so much for joining us today uh, for this uh, web conference uh, under the title Getting to Accountability, which will be exploring the role of Middle East and North Africa diasporas, uh, both individuals and activists and organizations in pursuing uh, transitional justice in their countries of origin. Uh, my name is Sarah Ann Rennick. I work with the Arab Reform Initiative and today's web conference is being hosted in partnership with the uh, Brookings Doha Center. Uh, and I think today's event uh, is particularly timely considering the conviction today in Copeland's of a former Syrian regime official uh, for crimes against humanity. Uh, so this is um, something that I think will be addressed today uh, in the discussion and how uh, tools such as universal jurisdiction can be utilized um, by those in diaspora for the purpose of seeking justice. So as I said, today's conference is going to be looking at different cases and different examples of efforts being done by uh, various uh, MENA diasporas in their pursuit of transitional justice, looking at both uh, different tools and frameworks and strategies that can be used, but also considering some of the obstacles and challenges that these groups and these activists face in, uh, in the pursuit of transitional justice. And we're very lucky today to be joined by four uh, very illustrious speakers uh, on the subject, both academics and practitioners. Um, first, we have Noah, Noha Abu Dahab, who is a fellow at the Brookings Doha Center, and she's also will be co-moderating uh, the, the conference today with me. Uh, she's an expert on transitional justice in the Arab region and has done extensive research on various efforts by diaspora groups in the pursuit of transitional justice, including the Yemeni case, the Libyan case, and the Syrian case. Uh, we'll then have a presentation by Ahmed Mifra, who is the director of the Committee for Transitional Justice and an Egyptian human rights lawyer, and he'll be looking at the Egyptian case. Uh, then Elham Saudi, who is a director, who is the director of Lawyers for Justice in Libya, which is perhaps the premier organization Libyan group um, pursuing transitional justice. And she's also a human rights lawyer. Uh, and then finally, Ibrahim Olabi, who is a barrister at Guernica 37 International Justice Chambers and who works on uh, international cases relevant to Syria and who I think we'll be talking about in part um, the Koblenz trial today. Um, and just as a matter of housekeeping for those uh, for the question and answer session, so each speaker will have about 10 to 15 minutes minutes to speak. Uh, then there will be a discussion amongst the speakers and then we will open the floor to a uh, question and answer. For those, those joining us by Zoom, we ask that you just type in your questions and questions in the chat function. And for those on Facebook Live to uh, just type your questions into the comment section and those will be um, transmitted to us. Uh, so I'll now turn the floor over to Noha, who'll provide a bit of a, a conceptual framework for today's discussion and then her presentation. Thanks very much, Sarah, and thanks to the Arab Reform Initiative for uh, devoting much needed attention to the role of new Arab diasporas in transitional justice. Uh, the Brookings Doha Center is very pleased to co-sponsor today's event, and I'm particularly delighted to join in this discussion with friends old and new. Um, so as we mark the 10 year anniversaries of the Arab uprisings, uh, many of us of course have been reflecting on the developments over the past decade. Um, but a lot of these conversations revolve around what went wrong, right? But when you look at the work of um, active members of the new Arab diasporas, the conversations become less defeatist and perhaps dare I say a little bit more hopeful. Um, and this is particularly true when we consider the work of transitional justice advocates, both at home and in the diaspora. Um, today's discussion will look at uh, how new Arab diasporas deal with issues of accountability and the broader issues of transitional justice. Um, so since, since the onset of the Arab uprisings, many, uh, many have left or fled or were forced to flee um, their home countries and the demographic of this new diaspora, of course, includes activist lawyers, civil society leaders who have generated already um, quite a bit of impact in the course of justice and truth seeking um, initiatives. So what exactly have they been doing to deal or, or to pursue accountability and transitional justice while residing outside of their home state? Um, how has the work of new Arab diasporas 
uh, been, how has it changed the way that we think about transitional justice and the way that we practice transitional justice? Um, and while there has been excellent research done on the role of diasporas historically in justice and truth seeking initiatives, the role of new Arab diasporas is still underexplored. Um, so today we'll be discussing, as Sarah mentioned, examples from Egypt, Syria, Libya, Yemen. Um, and these contexts are marked by renewed authoritarianism, uh, ongoing armed conflict and state fragmentation. And so we then must ask, how has the role of the state evolved in transitional justice processes, um, especially as the state continues, well, in, in many of these contexts, the state continues to act as primary perpetrator. Um, when we look at diasporic transitional justice advocates, they are mobile, they're relatively secure, at least in comparison to, the, to their fellow nationals in the home state, and they have access, right? Access to international policymakers, uh, access to international NGOs, access to the international media, access to war crimes prosecutors in Europe, and, and so on. Um, but what about their South-South engagement so, or their uh, collaborations between their organizations and other Arab diasporic communities? Um, how is such coordination um, changing transitional justice discourse and practice? So this is the general sort of framework for today's discussion, and I am sure my fellow fantastic speakers will be contributing several important insights to, to the discussion. Um, I'm just going to give a few remarks on my own work in, in this area, uh, mainly from a conceptual standpoint, uh, but with some examples from, from the region, including Yemen. So over the past several years, I've been looking at or examining opp the opportunities and challenges for the pursuit of accountability um, by Arab diasporas. I noticed that you know, many, many of those who left since the Arab uprisings um, or at least, or even since the latest round of armed conflict started, for example, in Yemen in 2014 and 2015, many of these people who have, who have left or were forced to flee um, are diverse professionals, right? They are um, human rights lawyers, they are doctors, they're judges, uh, they're journalists, um, they're former politicians, and they're artists. Um, one thing that has bolstered the, the presence, I guess, of, of, of human rights professionals in the Arab diaspora is the establishment of several civil society organizations outside of the home state. And this is, of course, in large part due to the shrinking of the civic space in, in the home state um, uh, in several countries across the region, which has also seen the obsessive enactment of laws that restrict the activities of these uh, NGOs and civil society organizations, and also very much restrict their, their, their very existence. So as a result, several civil society organizations have moved their offices outside of the home state and set up shop um, in, in a host state. But it has also led many in the diaspora to establish new civil society organizations outside of their home state, where they coordinate efforts to um, geared towards transitional justice advocacy and in close coordination with their fellow nationals in the home state. Um, so this demographic of new Arab diasporas and their engagement with transitional justice initiatives is important because it is changing the way that we practice transitional justice um, in, a, in a number of ways. First, the state is increasingly abandoned as the primary arbiter of transitional justice. Um, you know, oftentimes, especially in formal transitional justice processes, um, they are state endorsed, right? Such as through the enactment of transitional justice laws. But with ongoing armed conflict and, and repression in several countries in the region, activist lawyers and civil society professionals um, at home and in the diaspora, many of whom are victims themselves, right? Uh, they tend to pursue transitional justice without and indeed against the state. Secondly, the, the role of new Arab diasporas in the pursuit of accountability has expanded or has created opportunities for an expanded transitional justice process that is not only limited to, um, or doesn't only focus its attention on crimes committed by domestic perpetrators. Um, so instead, transnational diasporic um, uh, transitional justice actors have been casting a wide 
internet of accountability that targets the role of foreign governments and multinational corporations um, in the perpetration of crimes within a given MENA context. So for example, you can't really talk about justice and accountability in Yemen without addressing the role of Western arms exporters, um, uh, whose weapons, of course, has been, have been used to kill innocent Yemeni civilians. And one example of this effort, of course, is the work of uh, Yemeni NGO Muwatana, that, that is partnered with the Berlin-based European Center for um, uh, Constitutional Human Rights, together with an Italian NGO. Um, these criminal complaints aim to hold both the Italian state and its arms companies accountable for their complicity in crimes committed in Yemen. You can't, I mean, in a similar way, you can't really talk about justice and accountability in Libya, uh, Syria, um, or Sudan without addressing the role of multinational corporations. Um, some well-known examples include the Canadian construction company, SNC-Lavalin's uh, activities in Libya, or the French cement company, Lafarge in Syria, or French company, Amasis, and its supply of surveillance systems to the Libyan and Egyptian governments who have used this equipment uh, to target political dissidents. Um, French bank BNP Paribas and its activities in Sudan and propping up the regime there pre-uprising between 2002 and 2008. All this to say that while efforts to prosecute individuals during an ongoing conflict are certainly not new, this is not a new thing. I mean, look at the ICC and its arrest warrants um, against Gaddafi and Omar al-Bashir, for instance, the accountability gaze is becoming wider through these criminal complaints that target foreign states uh, or, or you know, allies of, uh, foreign allies of, of authoritarian regimes and their corporations. And this is increasingly led by actors in the diaspora. Um, and this is, this is important because oftentimes the role of external actors in exacerbating conflicts in the region, including you know, examples from today, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and of course, Egypt, is insufficiently addressed because the transitional justice focus is largely um, uh, uh, centered on domestic perpetrators. So this, would, this creates a severely amputated picture of the historical injustices um, in each of these countries, which weakens prospects for an effective um, trans transitional justice trajectory. But the power of these transnational alliances um, between international, diasporic, uh, and home state justice advocates does a lot more than simply wrap up accountability efforts. It expands the parameters of transitional justice in three ways, which I will sum up very quickly here. First, um, these diasporic efforts demonstrate that we don't need to wait for a transition to peace in order to pursue uh, justice and truth-seeking initiatives, whether through documentation, universal jurisdiction, memorialization. So the concept of you know, this ideal transition that needs to happen in order to pursue justice has been completely shattered by um, the actions of these actors on the ground. Secondly, the focus of the new Arab diasporas on documentation and on accountability constitutes a form of resistance itself, right? It's a resistance to the hijacking of narratives, to the erasure of history, to ongoing repression. Um, so by prioritizing justice and truth-seeking initiatives, transitional justice advocates wage a different kind of political resistance that absolutely requires addressing the past. Third, certain, certain diasporas tend to um, leverage criminal accountability in particular to, um, uh, as a tactic that sets in motion other uh, uh, justice and truth-seeking efforts that address additional complex crimes, such as land and property expropriation, for example. Um, and I think this is because criminal accountability is a viable option in the immediate term, in a way, um, especially universal jurisdiction. Uh, and it helps sustain um, a certain level of attention to justice issues that require a deeper reckoning with a broader history of injustices and one that isn't confined only to the post-Arab uprising period. Um, and this is important because I think we, we may often forget that the drivers of the Arab uprisings were indeed this, these histories of injustices, social, civil, political, economic rights violations, and leaving that past unaddressed 
unaddressed um, in whatever transitional justice process unfolds is would of course be detrimental. Um, no, I'm going to end with perhaps a less optimistic note by by pointing to a major challenge that faces the diaspora, which is polarization. Um, I mean, there are many challenges, but this is this is this is one that um, I struggle with in particular. I struggle to kind of figure out um, how this is how this is impacting, how it will continue to impact the work of transitional justice advocates, um, social media, disinformation, surveillance, geopolitics, and many many other factors contribute to such polarization. Um, in my conversations with active Yemenis and Egyptians in the diaspora in particular, the lack of sufficient spaces in which they can exchange their ideas and engage in a difficult dialogue without fear of repercussions and intimidation, that lack of, of sufficient space presents a major obstacle to effective coordination and mobilization. Um, and I, I'm curious to hear what um, what our, my fellow panelists have to say have to say about that from their own experiences. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Noha. Uh, I think we're going to turn now to Ahmed. Uh, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, thank you, Noha, and thanks for Sarah for uh, getting this opportunity to speak about the role of uh, human rights defender and Egyptian human rights defender in diaspora. Uh, I am Ahmed Mifrah, Executive Director of Committee for Justice, Geneva Based Association, uh, a committee for justice established in 2015 uh, with diverse uh, human rights advocates, uh, Egyptian and Swede and Swiss. And the main role for uh, CFEJ and Committee for Justice is to working uh, to uh, help the victims, and especially in Egypt uh, and in MENA region, and they try to preparing uh, to transitional justice period in any country that we are focusing on, especially Egypt. Uh, I will uh, get this opportunity to speak about uh, human rights, Egyptian human rights and diaspora. And uh, I will uh, begin with um, why we are in diaspora. Actually, uh, the main reason that we are outside uh, Egypt and in diaspora now, this is because we try to uh, help the victims uh, uh, of injustice in Egypt. And uh, we think that there is a better methods and opportunity to work from diaspora than in Egypt. And there is a possibility to work, there is a, a, a convenience to work, and there is ability to save uh, uh, the document and the data that we uh, get from the field, from Egypt or from other countries, and put this kind of data in a secure place outside the state uh, uh, border uh, far from the, uh, the hands of the security authorities. And uh, also we think that there is the ability to move to advocate uh, for, uh, for the cause. And, and we, the most important thing for us also is that the country that we are live, uh, especially the Western society, uh, they have uh, the means that allow activists to work better and advocate for protecting victims' rights. Uh, basically, uh, uh, we are in diaspora, pursue transgender justice because we think that defending because we think that this is better for defend victims' human rights violation, especially in Egypt. For the the. the how we work from diaspora, we think uh, that, uh, uh, or how we could, uh, the question, how we, how we continue working in international justice, I need to be clear or to give uh, uh, our audience that there is no currently way to practice transitional justice in Egypt because there is, there, because it has not been implemented yet. We are still in the preparation stage. We try to work professionally uh, and to take lessons. 
and to learn from different experiences in order to reach the best methods and mechanism that allow us to document and uh, uh, preserve the violation so that we can open this file again in any stage of transitional justice, which could one day serve as the foundation for a movement toward accountability in Egypt. What, uh, also in my opinion, uh, the whole point uh, for us uh, preparing for, for such kind of preparing ourselves to uh, 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 try to, the whole point is to learn from the past and prepare ourselves for the future. This is the main thing that we are now trying to uh, uh, do, especially uh, for Egypt's case. Um, we build, uh, be, be, because of that, we try to uh, uh, build our partnership uh, to solve this, or to, regarding this issue, working on transgender justice. We look mainly at examples that are closest to the Egyptian case. Unfortunately, the situation in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya is different than Egypt. So we try to observe what is the, the what is the closest model that we can that we can uh, uh, the, the model for the Egyptian dictatorship. We we, we think that the situation in uh, in in, uh, in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya is different, and the Egyptian situation is closer to the case of military dictatorship in South America uh, or the dictatorship in Eastern Europe in 17 and 18 uh, in the last uh, century. Uh, these are the models that we look and draw inspirations from the experience that is the human rights defenders lived uh, at this time. We try to, to see or to observe how they are work from diaspora, how they uh, or they how they are working from home, and bear, uh, and we, we we bearing in mind that we are working at the present time, not in the 18th or 17th or 90s, because the situation is different now. There is more. Uh, th there is now. There is a lot of things that is not in 18th, especially in the way for document violation or communicating with the victims or others. Uh, uh, and we, 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 we are open to work uh, 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 and are inspired by different experiences, whether from regional organization or international organization to uh, uh, which to serve the, the interest of our file or what is closest to the Egyptian case. When we are, after we are observing this kind of work, we see what is the kind of regional mechanisms that we could engage to, to help or to support our uh, our file and uh, uh, to support the, 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 the transitional justice in Egypt and this kind of cases, which is, I said, is different than one in Syria and Libya and Yemen. We, we believe uh, that uh, for the, the, the regional mechanism, uh, for, for us, it doesn't exist because they have no credibility. Uh, for example, the League of Arab States and the African Commission and others, they, they are very weak. So we decided to, we, we, we try to reach out the, the independent mechanism that can serve the rights of the victims at the present time and establish uh, the credibility of the file of future violation in the transitional justice phase. So, um, in, in CFJ, we, we, we choose to engage with the mechanism independent like Human Rights Council uh, mechanism, especially the, the mechanism of uh, the special procedures. Uh, and uh, we think, uh, and, and for us, this, guy, this mechanism, human rights mechanism, the UN human rights mechanism, it's not only communicating it's, it's not for only communicating with them uh, or their expert or something like that, but uh, 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 for us, it's established the credibility of the file of the violation that we are working on, which leads, uh, uh, which lead uh, 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 greatly to dealing with 
in the future at any stage of transitional justice without fear or worry of international or local uh, uh, mechanism. And we think that this kind of work, it help uh, uh, our data that we are bringing from the field and also tell to in future, because we are documenting it as a way that human rights, international human rights mechanism needed. Uh, and uh, this is for us give a credibility uh, uh, for this information. And also it held the victims uh, right now in, in the short term, if I can say that. So this, this way of communicating with international organizations, especially the United Nations mechanism, it held our, uh, uh, our vision for uh, to, to 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 document the cases, uh, the in, uh, as we think it's a very good first step uh, to help uh, the victims in any transitional justice uh, uh, in future, and to uh, uh, to to uh, uh, and to to give the Human Rights Council and the UN mechanism to work on the case right now to help the victims. Uh, 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 in the short term. For, for doing that, there is many difficulties with uh, and the challenges we, uh, we are faced. Uh, uh, first the challenges that we are faced is, uh, as in my opinion, of course, that is faced that the, the, the human rights defender, Egyptian special human rights defender in diaspora is First, the difficulties on the personal level. Life in diaspora uh, dif uh, differs from uh, life in the homeland. And um, a lot of human rights defenders and the human rights uh, uh, activists uh, go through uh, tough experiences and the challenges. Uh, either they succeed in working to uh, overcome them or they fail and remain in an endless cycle uh, of problem. We, we face a lot of, we, we, I see a lot of cases such, such like that. And um, on the other level, uh, uh, I can say that the, the security situation inside country, the country like Egypt, inside Egypt itself, uh, uh, this is the second challenges because we are not separate from the, the situation inside Egypt. Because uh, the more serve the situation inside the country, uh, uh, the more uh, uh, it affects our work abroad. For example, the more serve the repression, the more the team are unable to move. And this affects the work in one way or another, especially our work from uh, outside because we are not uh, separate from our team and our employee and the human rights defender was still inside Egypt and they try to work and collect information. They are the first step for us uh, and, uh, and the, 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 the challenges that they phase is effect, of course, our work from diaspora or from abroad, Egypt. The second, the third, uh, if I can say that, uh, the security states has started to consider the diaspora and the human rights association abroad as a real threat. We, we, we see this kind of uh, threats since two weeks now, beginning in 2000, I can say beginning in 2019, late 18, that the, the government uh, focused on human rights defender in diaspora and to try to uh, uh, threaten them in many ways, uh, uh, whether directly or indirectly. As uh, example, direct methods such as blackmailing them or submitting security reports against them uh, to uh, the Western country that they lived in accusing them of being terrorists, as example, or indirectly through the Congo's uh, groups uh, in the United, uh, uh, such like United Nations, places like United Nations and Brussels and Geneva. Uh, uh, Brussels and Geneva, they are they carry out the propaganda against the human rights defender in uh, in diaspora and intimidate uh, them 
uh, uh, and uh, begin the propaganda against them uh, uh, for uh, for try to intimidate uh, intimidate them and say that look they are this is the Egyptian people who left the, the or Egyptian youth who left uh, the country and stay outside Egypt now and they are uh, try to uh, uh, separate fake uh, news against the country, against the regime and the blah, blah, blah. So all this. So we, 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 we since 2019, I think, uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, intimidation and reversal of the human rights defender outside uh, Egypt uh, target itself. Uh, for... Uh, uh, my opinion, all of this is uh, this kind of all uh, the, all this war uh, is, in my opinion, is helping the the, the, the role of uh, human rights diaspora and human rights uh, situation in Egypt. Um, and I need to 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 say that we can't say that. All what you are doing in, in, outside Egypt, especially in diaspora, uh, it affects uh, the situation, especially the, 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 the situation of detainees or uh, the situation of political uh, detainees inside the prisons or others. It's not the main reason for changing the, the situation of them inside Egypt or, uh, but we think that uh, the pressure that is uh, the human rights defender in diaspora is due, and their work it's uh, uh, um, it's affect uh, the government and uh, uh, and also it's help the the the, the Western uh, uh, governments and the the allies of the Egyptian regime uh, to pressure them and to change the situation for us. Uh, the, 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 the Egyptian abroad uh, uh, of uh, efforts of the diaspora and the continuation of a few organizations inside the country to work, uh, move and face the security operations, the CC regime would have become the best human rights uh, uh, regime in the world uh, because the rule of Egyptian diaspora outside Egypt and the continue of human rights defender in Egypt uh, except that you will see that the, 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 the CC regime is the best regime in the, in the whole world who respect the human rights. Uh, this is for me and my opinion the role of human rights in diaspora, human rights defender in diaspora, uh, they doing a very good job uh, to try to inform the, the international society and the international organization about the uh, uh, real situation of uh, human rights uh, in Egypt. And in my opinion, also it affects a lot. This is the, if I can say that, this is the, the only file uh, that is the, the effect, if I can say effect or give a pressure uh, against the regime in Egypt since it, uh, since the coup in 2013. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Ahmed. Uh, I can already see that there's a lot of questions coming in for you, so we'll have a lot to discuss. Okay, I think now we're gonna turn to Ilham. Hi, <laughs> thumbs up if you can hear me. This is always very strange, good. Um, thank you, and it's, it's great to be in, in, in this company. Um, I will try to keep my intervention to a minimum because I do see questions coming in and I'm really, I'm really much more interested in the conversation than, than listening to me pontificate on the, on the topic. Um, and so I will, I will talk a little bit about um, how I, got involved in my organization. And then I will look at some of um, the questions around what it really means to be doing transitional justice work in 
um, in this context. And then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with looking at some perhaps some challenges and, and, and some opportunities for collaboration. Um, in terms of uh, the question that I was asked was how did we decide to pursue transitional justice from the diaspora? And I'm not sure I would say that it was really a decision as much as it was a reality that was on us. Um, so I was a lawyer and I was outside the country when the uprising happened. And um, and what I what I and my colleagues, when we founded um, Lawyers for Justice in Libya was very much about thinking, okay, well, here is our toolkit, which is the law, and this is our location, and there's something happening on the ground and how can we support that? And so I, I think it's important, at least for me, not to be as deliberate, to, to pretend that this was a deliberate decision, because I don't think it was. Um, I think I would much prefer to have been on the ground when it all kicked off and I got there as fast as I could. And I think that's an interesting part of the diaspora story as well, that I think we forget that there is different levels of diaspora, right? There were people who were diaspora before 2011 and who dropped everything and returned back to their, to their countries when this happened. And I speak for myself and many others in Libya who in 2011 were, were desperate to return. Um, and then there was a diaspora that was created by this, and there's also the, the double diasporing, if that if you can apply it as a verb, of people who sort of were in the diaspora, came back and have returned to the diaspora. So I think we need to also think a little bit about how we use that term, because um, I think we use it too, too homogeneously. Um, what was very clear about the Libyan uprising is that it became very violent very quickly. And so as lawyers, immediately our mind went to accountability and, and to documentation. And I think that as well sort of dictated again why this decision to join transitional justice work or accountability work happened. And so the reality for us was like, okay, well, there is this um, uprising happening. The It's turning very ugly very quickly. Um, Gaddafi was extremely unpopular. And so we thought that there could be momentum in getting action happening in international fora quite quickly because of his specific character. Um, and so that together kind of lent itself to where we ended up. And so we started thinking about effectively three elements to this work. One is, well, there needs to be evidence that needs to be preserved. And so there comes in a role that the diaspora can be very proactive in, which is helping secure and protect evidence uh, and also deliver evidence to key um, third state act, to third sort of third parties that might be interested in it. The second was pursuing accountability and trying to explore what that would look like. And so for us as lawyers for justice in Libya I was immediately thinking to the International Criminal Court just because of how quickly um, things turned very ugly. And the third is looking ahead and what role there could be in terms of prevention as well of um, of, of future violations. And so I think for us, that's how we structured our, our work. And, and the way that manifested itself was in supporting, training people on the ground on collecting evidence, um, helping them secure it, for be becoming the conduit for that evidence. Uh, the second was lobbying really heavily to get uh, at the time an ICC mandate on, on Libya, to get the international community engaged on Libya and, and acting as the, as a facilitator between those two elements to the extent that we could. And in the third one on, on the concept of prevention, uh, we were thinking, okay, there are a lot of people taking up arms uh, in this fight and what can we do to help that? And one of the things that LFJL um, did, did, and I would dare say did quite well at that phase was training those who took up arms on um, the, the uh, some international humanitarian law and human rights law and using technology very efficiently to access those people. And that was uh, enabled because of us being in the diaspora and having access to say people in the UK who had worked on rules of engagement for the British military who could help us put something in place really quickly. Um, and I think it's, so we ended up probably now if I had to define ourselves that we are an accountability diaspora organization, but I don't think that's how we were intended. And maybe it was subconscious on some level because our name is super descriptive and maybe that's why we called ourselves Lawyers for Justice in Libya. So maybe we should have just added from the diaspora or something. But I think it, you know, in our mind, it was always going to be a dual identity where we would be able to facilitate the external, but also be active in the internal. And I think I want to take a moment and just pause at this identity issue because I, I would feel confident saying that all of us in the diaspora struggle with it. Um, struggle with this identity of being the outsider inside and the insider outside of the country. Um, and what that becomes, whether that becomes an obstacle to your work, which a lot of, for a lot of us, it sometimes does because you're constantly justifying your existence. 
and apologizing for it or whether you actually own it. And I think it took us the best part of the last 10 years to say, hold on a second, this isn't an obstacle. Perhaps, just perhaps this is an asset that we are always the insider in international fora, but bring that it's, you know, the outsider perspective when we're in the country, but it's not a, it's not a happy identity. And it's not one that I think most of us are comfortable being. I think we, you know, for the majority of us, and please correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I, I never like to talk for a big group of people. I personally would have preferred to be on the ground always, um, but you accept the identity that you find yourself in. Um, and I think it's important to, to do that because um, it's important to kind of discuss that identity issue, discuss its flaws, discuss its challenges, because I think that also brings us credibility with our partners on both levels, on the international level and the local level for us to say, look, this is, you know, this addressing these questions that come up, because one of the things that will always come up when you're working in diaspora is who your allegiance is to really. Uh, what's the motives behind your work? Why are, you tar why are you apparently targeting certain actors and not others? What's your hidden agenda, yada, yada, yada. And I'm sure all of us have heard all those accusations. And I think unless we kind of are much more open about discussing what that means, it's really important. Um, it's, it will all continue to be a, a, a question mark that's applied to the diaspora as a whole. Um, and then, and you know, in thinking about, okay, so now we're a diaspora, we're working on transitional justice. We always debate as, as people who love the law and a group of lawyers, what does that really mean? It's like the endless law school question, right? What is transitional justice? Is it justice in transition or is it some kind of form of specific justice? Does the transition qualify the justice? Um, and I think I'm, I love having those debates and I'll have them endlessly in coffee shops. Um, but I think when we come to think about substantive work and real work, it's it's really important to take a moment to just, to really think about what we, what we mean when we use the terms, because a lot of us use them in, in shorthand as well. And so LFJL actually had a moment where we're like, well, we all use this language as shorthand. We profess to say that this is what people are looking for, but have we actually spent time to actually understand what people really think this term means? And so for the last um, six months, we've been working on a survey across the country to try and understand 10 years on from this conflict, what are, the, what are perceptions of justice on the ground in Libya? What do people mean when they say justice? What do they not mean? And um, shameless plug that should come out in about two months time, but it, at, at the moment it's been really revelatory to us. Um, and it's also highlighted a, a really clear discrepancy be between what people have told us in the survey, which was very deliberately inclusive of every political group we could think of, of uh, you know, key demographics across the country, very disenfranchised groups, and what the political class are saying this is about. And I think there is room for us to do a lot of work. So on the one side, we, you know, it was very clear from these surveys that accountability needs to be at the center of transitional justice for it to get that ownership we want at the public level. Yet when we talk about um, options available or the path or the roadmap for transitional justice in Libya, and indeed it is a very fundamental part of the roadmap for the political process that's currently undergoing in Libya, the, the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum places um, what is called al tasaluhiya, which is problematic, right? Because that means reconciliatory justice as opposed to transitional justice. And it's a, it's a very deliberate terminology and it's one that now has taken over the dialogue in Libya. And it's very difficult to get that into the, into, into really talk about that, that def definition. And it's a deliberate redefinition of the term. And um, as a member of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, um, I had endless fights of saying, you can't be re referencing Adalat al or reconciliatory justice because that is A, not a thing, and B, reconciliation is only a part of, of, of transitional justice if we're going to talk about it, and we need to think about how that fits in. And so I think in the end, the, the kind of compromise wording in the Libyan roadmap is reconciliation founded in transitional justice, which is still a non-helpful fix because that for me doesn't work, but at least I got the concept of transitional justice into the draft of the roadmap, but it's still made almost as a qualifier to the reconciliation, but the core is still reconciliation. And why is that? Why do I sound like I'm a bitter person who doesn't want to reconcile? It's not about that. It's because my constituents are victims. And the way reconciliation is approached in the Libyan scenario is putting pressure on victims to forgive and no pressure on perpetrators to account. 
And I think that is the fundamental flaw of the definitions we're talking about. And until there is a genuine readjustment of this concept, so it's looking at it from the victim's perspective and not the perpetrator's perspective, then there's where we need to work. And I, if I am to be critical of transitional justice, I think in general, a lot of the methods of transitional justice are, in, are enshrined a little bit in appeasing perpetrators or bringing them to the table or, re, or, or reintegrating them. And, and if you get that done in a way that is, doesn't get that balance right, it will tip in the wrong way. And what you end up with is the majority of the pressure being on victims. And their, their, their lack of forgiveness is the holdup in this process. Um, and we're seeing that play out now in the Libyan situation. So I think that it's, it's important to think about how we use those concepts as well, because I think we often use them in shorthand, but also not to be so willing to always, um, or to, to humor the kind of replaying with some of the terminology because words are so powerful in these contexts. And then as we're talking about definitions and as we're lawyers, that's what I live for is defining terms. I think it's important to also think what we mean by diaspora when we're asking this question of the role of diaspora in transitional justice, because I mean, even in the Libyan context, the diaspora in Tunisia versus the diaspora in European capitals has different limitations on what they can do and different abilities on what they can access and in different ways. So for example, the diaspora in Tunisia has access to a lot of decision makers on Libya because that's where a lot of the UN based, you know, UN entities are based, but they're also in very close proximity to Libya where a lot of the perpetrators are and can access Tunisia clearly. So when we're talking about the diaspora, I don't think it's as homogenous as we might use it in shorthand. And it's important to think about location. Uh, what caused the, that diaspora to, to exist because of uh, you know a large percentage of the Libyan population was diaspora was in the diaspora before 2011. So can we presume their motivations or their views are aligned with those that were created post 2011? How do you create a unity there of purpose? Is there a unity of purpose? And if we look, you know, we're celebrating the Germany success today, and it's very worthy of German of, of success. And but a, a great part of that is not attributable to Germany's pioneering efforts on rule of law. It's because there is a a substantial and active Syrian diaspora there that has managed to unify around this, these causes and, uh, and have had a phenomenal impact on the way Germany deals with the Syria file full stop. And I think there is a question as well about how successful we, we can be as, as diaspora. And, uh, and I think there's a lot to be learned from, from the Syrian example in that context. Um, I will, um, I mean, Ibrahim and I share an office, so in terms of cooperation on the South-South uh, collaborations, <laughs> we should be doing more than we do. Um, but I think there is a lot of scope there uh, in kind of moral support and kind of, you know, physical support and all of, you know, and actually sharing spaces physically, mentally, etc. But also, I think, you know, a lot of the perpetrators we're thinking about that we might choose to pursue in the diaspora and that we have the ability to pursue in the diaspora are common are common perpetrators. So the people, you know, the international actors who are involved in Libya, Syria, and Yemen are not different. And so there is definitely room to kind of bring those claims a bit more jointly or, or even the kind of um, advocacy to be done a bit more jointly. Um, I think Ahmed touched beautifully on the challenges of, of being in the diaspora and the, especially the personal and human challenges. So I won't, I won't spend time on that. Um, but I will say uh, one thing, one further thing about the concept of accountability, because I think a lot of times when we're talking about accountability, we think of it in terms of criminal accountability, or we think of it in terms of um, sort of capital A accountability. But I think a lot of work can be done on the desk on the lowercase accountability in terms of advocacy, awareness raising campaigns. Um, and here again, I'm thinking of opportunities that could rally around common uh, common actors in Libya and Syria and Yemen who care about their public profiles in, in, in the European capitals and what could be done in terms of affecting some of those um, PR elements of, of those actors and, and there's a lot that can be done by the diaspora in that context. Um, there's so much more I want to say but I just wanted to put these sort of few concepts out there to kind of get the ball rolling and I'm hoping I've put more questions than answers out there. Um, and I'm looking forward to a discussion and I'm really looking forward to listening to Brian. Okay, thank you so much. I can already see questions coming in as well related to your presentation. And so now we'll turn to Ibrahim for the last presentation and open up for discussion amongst the panelists. 
Perfect. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And it's always difficult to to continue after such great uh, great speakers. Um, and I, I do agree, Ilham, that we do share an office, and we need to share more once we do return to that office eventually. Once the the, the, the vaccine program gets us somewhere. Um, so to start to start on a very positive note, as a Syrian diaspora, um, a lot of us don't believe neither in transition nor in justice at the moment uh, in in Syria, with the kind of amount of atrocities that happened. Um, and the scale and range of, of, of crimes that were committed, there were a lot of uh, victims that, and survivors that we speak to, and, and we ask them what justice means to them, and, and it, it's impossible for them to say that this act or this thing will get me justice for what I, I, uh, I lost. And in, in light of the political deadlock in Syria, uh, many don't feel that there will, will be a transition anytime uh, soon. So perhaps to start with that, you know, as diaspora using the term transitional justice in the Syrian context at the moment creates a lot of sensitivities and goosebumps. And it's not something that we can easily use because at the beginning of the Syrian uprising, a lot of international NGOs came down and a lot of lawyers and there were so many workshops and trainings in Gaziantep and in Beirut about and in Amman about transitional justice, right? In a way, raising hopes at the time where the casualties were not as, as, as high. Uh, now, I wouldn't dare, as someone who used to train on these things, to step foot into uh, Syria or bordering countries and use those two words together. You know, there's a lot, there's different ways of doing it, but that word now is, is heavily uh, uh, stigmatized. There's the fight against impunity that is acceptable, there's promoting human rights, there is protecting victims, defending victims, more kind of verbs in, in a way, you know, it's something that shows what we are doing rather than what is achievable, right? So I think it's important at the beginning to, to say that, you know, the diaspora needs to be very sensitive as to, you know, academic and, and nice lawyerly uh, terms that might be perceived by uh, different Syrians and victims uh, and survivors in, in different uh, ways. So what, what I'm planning to do is to give a little bit um, of context on the Syrian situation, the Syrian diaspora, and through that shed light on, on some of my uh, kind of uh, firsthand experiences. So perhaps what, to start to set up the foundation, right? Um, the, the Syrian diaspora is huge, right? Because the kind of conflict that, that took place. I mean, half of the pre-war population is not, is not where, where they are. In Europe alone, the numbers are, you know, in between 800,000 to a million. Syrians who, who, who came uh, to Europe, a lot of them are victims, witnesses, and in some cases, even perpetrators. Um, and in the US, for example, there's also very strong Amer Syrian American diaspora that's been there for a very long time, and they've created incredibly strong lobbies. Now in the UK, they're you know, a group that I'm part of, the Syrian British Council, that's also mobilizing. And we're seeing a lot of you know, diaspora mobilizing in different countries uh, where they are. But we've got numbers, right? Which is not a, you know, something to brag about because it means we've, we had a horrible situation that led that led the numbers to flee and not uh, and not return. Um, so it, it's very important in that context when half of Syrians are not where they are and one of them are outside the country in the million, you know, say like 10, eight, 10 million are not in Syria. The question thus becomes, am I working on justice for Syria or for Syrians? Because in 2021, these two things mean completely different matters uh, because the, the Koblenz trial and a lot of these things um, does have a kind of uh, you know trigger effect onto the situation in Syria, but it's also healing and dealing with a lot of Syrians who are in Europe who kind of dealt with a lot a lot of these matters. So they kind of you know nation state borders where where are my kind of constituents as as Ilham uh, uh, said is a very different question for Syrians in in 2021 um, uh, at the moment. Um, so that's the, the, the second foundational point. The third foundational point is, as a lot of my colleagues would know, the, um, uh, it was a political decision over years and years to stigmatize going into humanities locally on a social level. I remember this when I wanted to go into law and I wanted to study in the UK and a lot of my kind of uh, friends were like, you've got a good result in your, in your A-level equivalent. Why do you want to go into law? You know, that, that, that is the most horrible thing you can go into. And I looked at what, you know, the requirements were in different countries for going into law and in, in, in Europe. And it was shocking. And in that sense, you had people who went into the, in, into the legal career in, um, in, in, in a lot of countries, and I can speak for, for Syria, um, some of them out of the conviction that they do want to change the status quo and they worked hard through the system and they became brilliant lawyers and they defended a lot of kind of detainees and, and risked their lives. But those are the mi minority of, uh, uh, of lawyers who managed to do that and, 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 take, and take the risk. And therefore, even when you had a lot of these people become the diaspora, 
the legal knowledge of human rights, international law, were either kept in the elite in Syria, and you can go represent Syria at the UN, or, you know, you did with kind of, you had to deal with the corrupt judicial, uh, you know, bribable system in, in Syria to, to, to get around, or you're part of the very few minority who really stood their ground, led a horrible life in Syria, full of risk, were not allowed to travel, and took those, uh, uh, you know, uh, principles uh, with you to Europe which are the majority of the people that are leading the efforts at the moment in, uh, uh, in Europe. But that's to say, as an organization, whenever I want to recruit, I always struggle to find, you know, in the diaspora, Syrian lawyers who are kind of very well educated, who are also principled and were not part of the kind of corrupt legal system and all of that to hire to, 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 to work on. So the ability to mobilize legal kind of diaspora is kind of very difficult when there was a political decision to socially stigmatize uh, humanities and uh, kind of socially increase the kind of uh, even amongst families and you know and Ibn Doctor you know he goes he's, 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 a, he's a medic right it is not it's not uh, he's, he's not a lawyer in, in, in that sense um, so this is the, the second point the third point and just in terms of set, setting setting the narrative is that there is a big role for the diaspora to play when it comes to um, setting the scene for accountability or, or transitional justice, dare I say those words together, um, uh, and where they are, right? Um, I remember my metrics usually, and, and, and these are very flawed metrics, um, you know, are either taxi drivers or barbers to figure out the word on the street of what's happening in, in Syria, right? So when they come in and they ask me, oh, where are you from? And I say Syria, they used to tell me, oh, you know, Assad committing crimes, 2012. 29, 2021, not that I've been in taxi during COVID, but you know, the last time in 2020, they wouldn't have a clue of what is going on in Syria. And when you don't have a clue, when you and, and that's in light of this very strong propaganda coming from the regime and Russia and other allies to make it sound as if it's a war, as if you can rape incidentally, as if hospitals bomb themselves to kind of give this collateral damage war feeling to the Syrian conflict, which then makes it very difficult for prosecutors to bring up cases and charge when the, the public interest argument is not there because your public is deceived uh, and, and is subject to a lot of propaganda or at least confused as to the criminality of the conflict uh, as opposed to it's just a, a horrible conflict that people die as, 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 as a consequence of, of, of you know, legitimate military uh, uh, activities. And so the diaspora play a very big role, should play a very big role in setting the narrative state, even the public narrative, something that a lot of Syrians unfortunately did not do uh, at the beginning because we, famous sentence, everybody knows what's happening in Syria might have been true 2012 to 2015 but then you know we have the blessings of isis and foreign interventions and all of a sudden you know it just becomes too complex at best or a war on terror at at, at, at worst so there is this kind of truth and narrative and it's also mobilizing other members of the diaspora getting the victims to come and speak out you know it is so difficult for them you know you spent literally that was told to me by 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 one witness i spent my life running from the police now you want me to go to the police and you know give give a witness statement although they're in different countries the whole you know feeling that i'm just going to go go to the police or give a statement in front of court or anything like that um is something that the diaspora needs to kind of help mobilize in order for people to come forward, to feel safe, if obviously voluntarily, and if that's something that, uh, uh, that they want to, uh, to do. And obviously getting the space for people to speak and, and debate uh, uh, those, th those matters. Which brings me now to the Koblenz trials when it comes to, to, to debate. I think one of the main fundamental roles of the Syrian diaspora is to trigger debates around those topics, right? Um, because there is a safe space to do so. And the Koblenz trial in Germany was one of the main examples where it triggered debate as to the priorities of who should be prosecuted. You know, these are defectors, yes, but they committed crimes. Yes, we get that, but you know, there are other people, but we can't get to the other people. So what should we do? And, and that was a very healthy uh, 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 discussion, heated, but healthy. Um, and then also it's triggered debates as to the witnesses. Some witnesses were accused of over-exaggerating, others, you know, of making things up, others of not even turning up. And so people were like, should we protect the witnesses? Um, should we call out things that we don't see uh, is, is correct? So the entire process was incredibly useful for the diaspora to engage using this case study 
to see, you know, if there was any sort of bigger efforts at one point in time, what are the issues that we should kind of, you know, uh, uh, anticipate in, in, in that sense? It triggered, for example, an issue between uh, accountability for torture um, for those who were detained uh, versus saving the, the current detainees. So if I can make a deal, because at the moment st abuses are still on, on, ongoing. And so victims had and survivors had one view said, you know, if I can figure out where my son is, that takes president, uh, precedent over, you know, holding that perpetrator to account. And, you know, and so that those kind of different views, because all of us are into that diaspora, a large part of the victim and survivors association, it allowed for that healthy debate, which any civil society should have been able to have, but couldn't because of the situation in, uh, uh, in Syria. And then there is a third role that I think is, is pretty important for the for kind of the diaspora to play, which is capturing those who come in new and wanting to do something for Syria, but do not know where to start or, 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 or you know, what to do. And so we still have new refugees coming in who are, you know, wanting to help, wanting to support justice efforts, but, you know, not knowing where to go and, and you know, feeling lost. For example, in the UK, every year, although, yes, it is, it is an island, but the Chevening, uh, you know, FCDO scholarships bring about 30, 40 Syrians and um, to, to, to the UK to study. And, and a lot of them want to do something and so it's it's the role for the diaspora to have you know uh, organizations councils bodies that would be able to say you know do you want to work on this issue do you still want to work on your home country obviously that everyone's it's, it's a choice others choose to integrate and that's uh, that's absolutely their 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 right to to have those mechanisms and vehicles in place to mobilize the, the newcomers and the, those who want to still work uh, 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 on on the country but obviously it is quite important also for the diaspora to stay in contact, as Luham said, with the, with the home country if they choose to work on, on those issues. The access to witnesses, the, the kind of crimes that uh, were, were committed. It's called strategic litigation and not litigation for a, for a reason because that strategy of where you start, how you start, who do you focus on are things that you know, the diaspora might have the benefit of having a bird's eye view uh, uh, over the, 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 you know, the entirety of, of the situation. I remember when I used to go down to Syria during the, the armed conflict, the last time I was there was in, was in 2017 during the chemical uh, attack. Um, and I remember that I, you know, I, it, it's kind of crazy psychologically because there's two parallel lives going on, one in London and, 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 and one in Idlib. And I, it, it's really difficult to kind of see both at the same time. But I struggle to think about anything strategic when I'm in Syria, it's impossible. You know, uh, it's it's the day by days. How do which house do I sleep in? Um, which tra the training is it public? Is or not? Do we have electricity? How do we get food and all of that? And I think the role of the diaspora is to add that strategic element to any sort of kind of justice component with the consultation of the people uh, 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 on the ground and being their uh, voice on on those matters. So all these issues are kind of more the bigger picture. Uh, um, you know, setting the narrative, mobilizing, um, you know, talking strategically, creating debates that sets the scene for any sort of, um, say, working towards any sort of uh, uh, justice uh, efforts. But I also think there are technical things that the diaspora should be able uh, uh, to do. And obviously, as we've seen in, in, in Germany, this was a complaint to the police made up by, by you know, Syrian organizations who mobilized witnesses with the help of a German organization to kind of get to the police. I mean, the police, I mean, we can give them the benefit of the doubt, but you know, they're, they're overworked, they're overstretched, uh, they might not push you know, necessarily for, for, uh, um, for this case you know, uh, compared to other cases. And that's where the technical kind of work work of the diaspora and efforts need to come in, right? So making these complaints and lobbying onto those domestic mechanisms. And that's domestically. But we also need to remember that in conflicts like Syria, where it's a proxy war and you have so many different actors and that justice internationally is state driven, we live in a state centric system, you need a state to sponsor your efforts. And I think that is a crucial role that the Syrian diaspora now has slowly working towards managing, and particularly the Syrian-American di di diaspora. We're hoping that the Syrian Brits are, are following suit. 
it is to, to really understand domestic politics, opposition, government, the civil servants, why MPs would care about this and not care about that, how you know New York communicates with London versus Brussels, and be able to mobilize that state where you are in and you have the easiest access to the to this to these institutions and they care about you because you're either a voter or a donor or you know whatever whatever other state interest they might uh, uh, have to mobilize the justice efforts with you. And if we look at a lot of examples, whether it's the Kurdish case or the Armenian case, we always see that there is a strong state that is that is kind of sponsoring. And when we look behind the state, we find a strong diaspora behind it. And, and that is fundamental to for, for them to lobby and understand the inner workings of that state to be able to push uh, 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 forward while also maintaining the fact that you know we, we have passports as Noha said we were able to travel and we're, we might you know I might kind of galvanize the UK to push a resolution the Human Rights Council something that we were successful in doing or can you know convince the state to take a case against Syria or something along these lines but then I should be jet setting across Europe getting support for that state through the local diasporas that are that are there you know and we managed to do that when the Netherlands decided to take the case that might end up against her in the International Court of Justice. We literally spoke to every kind of focal point we have in different countries and said, write to your foreign ministry, tell them to get a statement in support of the Netherlands in this, in this effort. And that is the kind of cross, you know, diaspora, Syrian diaspora inter interlink that, that, is, that is vital. Which leads me to the final point that even as Ilham, Ilham uh, uh, said, Across diasporas, this this is something that is that is pretty important uh, uh, for for you know the Syrian diaspora to understand. So in Libya, you know, it's the same kind of parties to to the conflict that that are there, um, and uh, and that's something that you know need to be kind of co coordinated uh, uh, on. But we recently started engaging with the Peruvian and and, and uh, diaspora and diaspora in kind of uh, you know Uruguay and uh, and trying to link with them and even the Ukrainian diaspora who have problems with Russia and the Georgian diaspora in London that we can work with is identifying your allies because in in it's 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 a regional battle and a global battle where all these proxies are moving things around and if they are able to move things around then it is our responsibility to unite, coordinate, and be able to push back as one front against those uh, against those things. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you so much. Noha, I will turn it back over to you if you wanna start with the, the discussions to the other panelists. Sure, thanks, Sarah. And thank you to the fantastic speakers. Uh, we've covered quite a bit of ground. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, one question each, if that's okay, Sarah, we have time for that, because I do see we have questions from the audience as well. Ahmed, let me, let me start with you. Um, I mean, you, may, you made clear that the Egyptian context is very different from, you know, the Libyan, the Syrian, the Yemeni context, for example. Um, and I wonder, uh, would, would the establishment in the diaspora of a people's tribunal for Egypt, would that be a worthwhile endeavor given given the context in Egypt, something perhaps similar to the Iran People's Tribunal as sort of a strategy to, you know, expose, um, you know, the, the violations and um, to, you know, create a space, a safe space for mm -hmm. discussion about accountability in Egypt. Okay. Um, in, uh, in my opinion, the, the role of Egyptian human rights diaspora is different, as I told in, uh, in uh, before is different um, also is different than Iran one because we are not totally uh, uh, separate from our homeland. There is still a route for our colleagues, human rights defenders still working inside Egypt. They collect information, they work to defend the victims and also they are present uh, victims inside in, in front of uh, the state security uh, courts, military courts, and others. Uh, and there is uh, still human rights defender working inside Egypt. But the role of diaspora, as in my opinion, also is, 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 is for Egyptian diaspora is different uh, because we uh, we are not totally. Uh, uh, um, separate from the, 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 the Egypt field. We are 
outside Egypt, we try to work, we try to try to help our friends and our colleagues inside Egypt to still work and still alive, if I can say that. This is for us the most important role. Second role is we used what we have from spaces, especially uh, we, we can advocate, we can travel, we can work, we, we, can, we, we can meet with the, with, with the stakeholders, we can meet with the international community, speak more about the violations happening in, in, inside Egypt and try to advocate and helping the victims. The third thing for us is different is we, we, we are now have the the, the 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 evidence of the violations so we are now in we are trying to collect it from the ground but we saved it outside egypt to use it in any transition just uh, uh, in in in, uh, in future and uh, um, the most important thing how so so we, we, we it's different yes it's it's different what i understand the situation in egypt yes it's different than in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya, uh, because it's complicated. You know, we we, we have uh, the if I can say the thirty percent of Egypt, the the, the Sinai, the the, the, the there, there are uh, internal conflict in Sinai, uh, and there is uh, what we, there is uh, we, there is what we believe that uh, uh, crime against humanity and war crime happening against the civilians, in, in especially in North Sinai. So, and in, in, other, in, in other areas, in Delta and in Upper Egypt, there is a dictatorship, a, dic a very hard dictatorship regime. They, uh, there is the shrink of civil, there is shrink of space of civil society that can work, they can, they, 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 they can uh, organize their work, no one can speak, uh, there is tens of laws against any, uh, 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 any freedom of exhibition, something like that. So we, it's complicated, so we, we try to take from each uh, 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 examples and to make this kind of new uh, uh, model uh, of diaspora role. We, we are in outside Egypt, yes, but we have a route inside Egypt and the, the political conditions and the, the situation in Egypt is different, yes, but we try to uh, uh, Solve it. Try to uh, uh, try to make a new. Uh, what I can say. Uh, uh, try to solve it. Try to prove uh, 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 some technical uh, ex uh, some technical uh, 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 improvement to help our colleagues and still working. Uh, and and we are bearing in mind, as I told, uh, that uh, what is the best way. Uh, what is the best model we can create to uh, still organize our work outside Egypt and also uh, uh, have uh, uh, all the information and the, the, the evidence outside Egypt and save it until we can, uh, uh, until there is any channels or hope for transitional justice buried or dealing with the bust. Okay. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, Ilham, a very quick question for you. I've asked you this question before. I, I think I asked you this question last year, but I'm going to ask it again. Um, why? I mean, there are a lot of moving parts, obviously, in Libya, a lot of external actors fueling the conflict, um, a lot of atrocities being committed. Why um, haven't there been, why haven't we seen any efforts um, uh, through to, to pursue justice through universal jurisdiction in the Libyan case, as the Syrians have been doing? Um, yes, you have. And I don't know whether my question, my answer will be any more satisfying this time. I, I think with the Libyan situation, what there's two, so it won't be a very quick answer, but there's two levels of issues here. One is that we have we have several avenues for accountability open to us in Libya in a way that in Syria, there isn't. Um, and that's been a blessing and a curse in the Libyan situation, because in a way, 
great, we have these avenues, but also it shuts down a lot of other avenues because when you go and try to campaign for something, they're like, but you've got the ICC, you've got a panel of experts, you've got this now fact-finding mission. Um, there's so many avenues for, for accountability that makes it difficult. So that's one problem. Um, and, I, and I think it's a false, it's a false explanation because actually the ICC's mandate is so limited, their resources are so limited and they are very ineffective as we've seen in Libya. The fact-finding mission is, is again a new um, investigative mechanism. It's not an accountability mechanism per se. Uh, the panel of experts is limited by the fact that it's hindered by the Security Council then operationalizing their advice. And so that with each of those, there's an obstacle. Um, universal jurisdiction is something that we as an organization are prioritizing, but for that to happen, you need several factors. You need political buy-in from the countries that there are better options. Um, you need a perpetrator coming through that country who doesn't have immunity, um, which we are, we're struggling with in the Libyan case. Um, and, and I think because a lot of them come at the invitation of the states that they're visiting or they are given immunity because they're there for a political process or you know a, bit, a million other reasons where they're not touchable um and the third is you know uh, there needs to be kind of a lot of education of the of the mechanisms in those countries to understand the libyan dynamics and and who the characters are in a way that requires a lot of a lot of time and a lot of effort and so on the on the last one on the first one there's a lot of work being done by by civil society but that's where the weakness of the libyan diaspora is uh, we haven't got the sort of intensity of presence in a single capital where that could become our main job. So I, I, maybe Ibrahim will tell me I'm wrong, but I think the, the, the sheer numbers of acts of Syrians in Germany made Germany a really clear jurisdiction and they could focus their efforts primarily on Germany. Whereas in Libya, we see a lot of efforts in a lot of different capitals that is scattered and it's not galvanized in that same way. And, and one of the things that I've just learned, for example, is that now in Germany, because of the incredible work of the Syrian diaspora, um, even like forms that you fill in for asylum have a question that says, you know, have you witnessed uh, human rights violations or have you witnessed war crimes? And, and so they're already at point of entry, almost kind of capturing the knowledge there is because they've got the advocacy worked and it's become part of the system. And I think we are a long way away from that. And it might be because of lack of numbers, it might be for lack of that. But for us, one of the biggest, biggest obstacle is a lack of political will. And, you know, we've, we've had perpetrators go through France, we've had perpetrators go through Germany um, that weren't, weren't interesting to those authorities because they A, were had immunity because they were there for, for a part of these political processes or B, um, they didn't know them well enough. Um, and I think there, there's a lot of work to be done. But yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, and it's, it's specifically a diaspora challenge as well. Okay, thanks, Elham. That was, uh, that was a robust answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ibrahim, um, understandably, uh, much of the accountability efforts uh, that have been going on for in, in the context of Syria have focused on crimes that have been committed since 2011. Um, do you fear that the pre-2011 atrocities will be forgotten or left unaddressed? And you know, what are the implications of, of leaving that past unaddressed, in your opinion? Well, you know, it's it's um, it's a good question because the timing at the moment is again the anniversary of the Hama massacre in the in the in the eighties, right? And uh, and there, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people were were, were killed and in, in cold blood and in shelling of, of Hama and uh, and Aleppo, uh, and a lot of survivors did make it to uh, uh, to Europe, but there there wasn't enough kind of momentum, political will, uh, documentation that you know could get. Uh, things beyond um, or, or you know to, to get the ball moving then or now because now it has been overshadowed as you say by, by, by the other crimes but there are a few points that I'd like to make first of all um, well, the, the efforts at the moment are more kind of criminal accountability right and and that is not the end of it so people remember Hama people remember the crimes and, and it, in fact the crimes of 2011 allowed us to shed light again on the 82 and say these are not new right so in a way it depends how strategically you use it you can kind of revive the old crimes by saying no yeah you know the worst horrible sentence that any politician would have said and have said to us is we want to bring back Syria like it was or Syria was a beautiful country it's been let's hear about Syrians how was prior to 2011. Um, 
let's give back Syrians the life they had. It's, it's a lot of things that, you know, an intern would write for a politician's speech and then they would just say it, which we always would backfire against saying, no, we don't want the lives we had because it was horrible. Um, and, um, and, you know, the, this is a dictatorship regime. And so we were, we're able to use the crimes post 2011 to revive the crimes um, before 2011, not in a criminal way, but, you know, criminal accountability is not what all kind of perpetrators care about in a way, you know, for the Syrian regime, for example, they care about the legitimacy of being the state. And then you being able to shed light on those kind of crimes that, that happened shows, you know, that the issues of uh, you cannot be, you know, be a legitimate state with those kind of crimes. And then it also helps it, you know, when, when we talk about the political process, when you talk about the political solution, talking about these past crimes also kind of assists you in saying, no, we don't want to return to what we had politically in, in, in a way. So that these are kind of the ways where, you know, if strategically used, the 2000 crimes used, uh, committed after 2011 can revive the, the, the past. Great. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Sarah, I'll uh, pass it on to you. Okay, thank you. So we have about 10 minutes, which leaves us just a little bit of time to answer some of the questions that are coming in from um, people participating on, on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, so we have a first question, uh, which I think is uh, definitely a question for, for Ahmed, but also for the other two panelists. It's about the use of new technologies. Um, and, you know, things like uh, ICT technology, social media, etc. And I think in the Egyptian case, what's interesting is that there's obviously a lot of transnational repression um, and that it's often used through types of surveillance technologies, uh, through these new technologies. So I'm wondering, the question is about, you know, is this, what is the constraints of these, this transnational repression on these these new technologies um, and hindering. And you had talked about um, the, the surveillance and the critical view of human rights defenders in the diaspora. So I'm wondering if you could comment on that. And for the other two panelists, I mean, you both spoke very much about the, the need for awareness raising and changing the narratives and countering propaganda. Uh, and so I'm just wondering from your perspective about these new technologies and the use of things like social media in that role. And Ilham in particular, I know that you have a podcast, a very popular podcast. Um, and if you're, if you see that this podcast, for example, is a, is a medium that can, that can contribute to that. Okay. Uh, for the first part, for, uh, for me, the, using the, um, the new technology, especially the, uh, the social media, is uh, something is most uh, important for, for, for us to first of all to communicate with the victims themselves and try to collect what as much as we can get from uh, from for from the, for, for for evidences uh, of the, the crime that we are uh, that we are documenting it. So we used social media and we used the, the new te technical and ways to, to communicate, uh, to collect information and also to, uh, to prove. But let me tell you, there is something as most important. Um, it's, it, it's not the final step, collect information by using social media. It's not the final step, it, it's the first step. And it's need a lot of work after to uh, uh, to verify this kind of information. And our experience uh, um, in the last five years, the Egyptian regime tried to release some fake cases and some fake uh, stories regarding violations happening in some uh, against some political detainees uh, in Egypt. Uh, to um, to something like to 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 separate this fake news and to target directly any organization, any human rights defender, use this information and to and and prove this as an evidence of uh, violations, uh, especially in some files like uh, enforced disappearances. Uh, uh, or violation happening inside the detention center. So, using te using the new technology and uh, of course, especially for communicating uh, 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 with the, the, the relatives of the victims, with the lawyers, uh, uh, especially the, 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 this kind of tools that's encrypted tools, uh, 
to save the, the if I can say to save their lives because they, many times they can arrest and the, the security see their phones or see the computers and if he uh, for the security if they find that there is a connection between this person and an international organization he will be inside the jail directly and maybe this will be ended him to die inside the jail so the, 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 we, we try to use this kind of, 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 of technology of course this is give the human rights defenders uh, especially in diaspora or working in human rights field now in Egypt a very good opportunity but this is not the end step this is the first step which needs more work and this is why I say that the, 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 the people inside Egypt the, the, the most important thing for us as a human rights defender is there is still our friend and colleagues still working inside Egypt to collect evidence and they try to verify the cases that it's appear in social media and it's appear in, 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 in any other social media's work. This is, this is very good steps. We use this, but uh, we need to verify this before we submitting it to United Nations as example or publish it in our uh, uh, report. So uh, yeah, so so and this is something kind of a different between between Egypt and 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 uh, and, and other countries. Um, on 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 sort of the use of technologies and media and social media, I, I I'll, I'll do the kind of positive and the negative, but I think one of the um, one of the reasons we started uh, the the podcast. Um, and we actually have, we have two, we have an Arabic language one and an English language one. Um, the reason we did that was because we were getting very frustrated with the simplistic explanation of Libya in the media. And we got frustrated with the lack of nuance, with the lack of explanation, with the lack of context. Um, and we thought, well, no one's gonna give us enough airtime to do that. And so we will create our own airtime. So that was kind of using a tool to, um, to really push our advocacy efforts and to reach decision makers directly. And I think it's it's really, um, it's it's worked on some levels because it, it has uh, increased awareness on Libya, but on some levels we should query whether that's the best use of our time. Um, but it, it's kind of, a, it was a gap that we felt we needed to fill. On, um, on social media and the like, I think um, I'll, I wanna say a couple of things because actually we have a, a report coming out uh, in the next couple of weeks on the online violence against women. Um, and I think there, you know, we always talk about a space that was created for civil society online when physical space was shutting down in the country and how vital that was. But the same abuses that you face physically sort of follow you online. Um, and the damaging effect that that can have on your mental health, your well-being, um, as well as your ability to do your work. And, and so what we're seeing as well is actually there is a closing civil society space online as well. Um, and, you know, those actors that we talk about um, who give arms to our um, to our states and who supply them with weapons also supply them with technological weapons. Um, and are also teaching them very well how to use um, the sort of online space to, sh to curtail civil society and to shut down civil society. And we've seen that numerously. If you look at the most popular, so the, the kind of when something happens in Libya, you'll get more tweets coming out of Saudi accounts or, or accounts in the Gulf than you will get out of accounts coming out of Libya. And that's not for lack of interest of Libyans. Um, and, and, you'll, and there is that kind of um, controlling of the space online. And so that's the bad story and that's the negative story. And I think if, you're, if we are going to be promoting social media and online spaces for people, then we need to equally be responsible and talk about digital security in that sphere and also self-care in that sphere. And we see that especially with women activists who are targeted in a very specific and very gendered way online. Um, I can speak for myself where I'll, you know, almost on a weekly basis we'll get images of kitchens being told that's where I belong uh, on my on my Twitter account and, and the like. Um, the flip side of it and what we've seen in COVID is actually things like Zoom and these kinds of setups have democratized um, advocacy and work. Whereas before, because we were the ones with the passports, we, we were the ones in the rooms. Now we can have closed rooms that would normally have required a trip to Geneva to occur with people from the ground. And I think there is some positives here that have come as a, as a sort of 
side effect of COVID that I really do hope we learn to continue to use going forward. And that's the creating a much more democratic advocacy space. Because one of the most uncomfortable things of being the diaspora is knowing you're in the room because you're the easiest person they could get into the room as opposed to the best person they could get into the room. And yes, you take advantage of that to get the cause forward, but absolutely, so most of the times it shouldn't be me in the room. And I think it's our duty as a diaspora to make sure that the right people are in the room. And one way to do that is using this technology. I think Ilham covered it pretty well also for, for uh, you know, on, on the Syrian case. I just like, would like to give one additional example is that the Syrian case has been really used um, to shed light on all this information propaganda campaigns with the use of electronic armies and and uh, and bots by the Russians and the, and, and the regime. And the one prime example of that is, is the white helmets, right? So you've had a rescue group who documented abuses, did a fantastic job, and you have physical trolls, people who kind of go out and, and you know, try and disinform that group. And, um, and then you also have the bots, right? The moment that we, we even you know, tried a few things, the moment any name White Helmets or any of the people's names gets mentioned on Twitter, I think they have Google notifications on in, in, in a way that they get informed the, the immediately before you could say anything, um, you know, start retweeting, but in, 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 you know, making all sorts of allegations, they retweet each other. It, it's, it's a lot of use of technology that you're unable to fight because you're, you're using the moral ground. You're using, I'm not gonna use quote unquote, ethical bots to promote my human rights stuff, right? I'm just going to wait until see how many genuine people, including those who are attending with us today, would, would retweet, you know, what I would say is happening. But that does not, you know, uh, get you any, anywhere when you're, you know, even even on Facebook, right? Like that, that film for summer, right? So why wow, is a good friend? She got the baptism and the Emmys and times 100 person. Channel 4 puts the video. Top comment, this is Al-Qaeda affiliate. And everyone and all the trolls like it because people go to the comment section for the alternative news right that's the human nature these days you read the mainstream then you go to the comment to see the word on the street well if the word on the street is not the real word on the street but is but it's, it's echo chambers and pushed through propaganda machines setting half way across Siberia, then you know you're, you're you're getting conflicted in that. And the white helmets and Forsama are very good examples of that. And these are the, these are individuals or, or organizations, uh, humanitarian uh, humanitarian groups and journalists, but they have a huge impact on transitional justice because they're the witnesses. If you discredit the people, you discredit the process. Um, you discredit their evidence. The White Helmets played a fantastic role in getting all the kind of soil samples of chemical weapons across to The Hague. But if you start attacking them, the OPCW will be like, I can't deal with this headache. Let me try and find my, my, my own way of, of, of you know, getting, getting that evidence. Um, and so at a time, I think one of the biggest mistakes that the Syrian diaspora did is that in 2013, and this thing came off, you know, the, the Facebook revolutionaries, the wild Facebook in, in that sense, right? And so a lot of people started saying, I will not be involved in Facebook, I'll not share news, I'll just go down and do my thing. And we left the space empty for trolls and bots to come in and fill that space. Um, and so I think the social media front is as important as the field front in the day and age that we are in. We've seen that, you know, from the US across the world, how, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all of those play, play a role. So it should not be undermined that you're, you know, you're a keyboard warrior because, you know, that has a negative, kind of negative thing associated to it. But it can, you know, you can be a warrior fighting on the right side. Okay, thank you. I think we'll maybe just take one more question since we are, we've actually run over time at this point. Um, this is a, a question regarding um, resource sharing, basically, and about internal capacities and uh, the lack of sufficient financial resources uh, for these kinds of efforts. Um, and, you know, Ibrahim had spoken about um, about the problems of resources and, and the problems in the diaspora. So I'm wondering, this is a question about many of the philanthropic organizations that exist in different diaspora communities. And if there's any collaboration between maybe those kinds of organizations that often fund things like um, purely humanitarian work um, uh, or things that are not too political for the specific reason that they're not considered too political. Is there any space there where these kinds of philanthropic diaspora organizations can also contribute financially or other types of resources to these kinds of transitional justice efforts? Should I, should I take that? Yeah, so, it, uh, so again, it depends, right? So because you've got the, the Syrian diaspora philanthropists, right? The, the businessmen, they, they exist, they're wealthy, they've got, they've got the funds. 
the problem is, um, you know, sometimes in, in the Syrian context, because it's so polarized and there's so many different groups, you need to be not just independent, uh, careful of your independence, but your perceived independence, right? You don't want to be this guy's organization, right? Which is not something you would say or they would say, but it's the, that, that's, that's something that could affect your objectivity in a highly politicized uh, uh, situation. Um, and so it is, it is, I mean, they're there to support some of them, you know, it's, it's rare to find people with courage who are willing to kind of fund, uh, you know, uh, using their own personal funds, human rights and political stuff and, and justice stuff, because humanitarian is just easier and it ticks the box and, you know, it, it, it does the job uh, uh, for them. Um, but there are there are some that are willing, but even those that, that we are willing that are willing, for example, we don't accept from any Syrian businessman any money. It's it's it, it because because we also have a human rights and business unit that where we go after Syrian businessmen. And so it will look incredibly odd if you are, you know, it will seems like as if I'm going against his or her competitors. Right. And and so there's this kind of perceived independence matter that that, that is uh, worrying. Um, and so we've as an organization, as I'm talking as the Syrian Legal Development uh, Program here, have opted to state funding um, and state funding uh, select states, not 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 all states for for very, again, perceived independence. Uh, uh, reasons. So, uh, but those people usually, if they are big donors, they're also very quite plugged in politically. They're also donors to a certain party that might be ruling a certain country or the opposition, or they have rich friends. You know that when you're in that billionaire, millionaire kind of uh, uh, society, you have good contacts with the foreign office and MPs and so on. And so leveraging their contacts is something that we've done before. Um, and they would be happy to introduce you to this person or that person and, and support you in, uh, uh, in that. But in terms of funds, it was a clear no-no for us. I might, uh, I might just jump in as well to kind of reaffirm some of that, because I, I think when it comes to the world of funding, perception creates reality in the sense that if the perception is that you are associated with a certain actor or perception is, it does not matter because it will impact on the reality of your ability to access information, to do work, to talk to people on the ground and stuff. And so it is it is a really difficult one. And it's one of the hardest things when you're desperate for funding and you have to turn down what looks like a blank check from someone um, because you don't know how they will use that either, right? Because they can they can declare how they funded you and they can say oh we're funding them for these reasons or whatever and so um it, it's not worth it's not worth it in the compromise that occurs there um but i think there's also one other thing to think about as well and, and i know um ibrahim mentioned this is, is the kind of the concept of uh state funders and there is the perceptions that are created by that the one thing i will add um and maybe it's a bit tongue-in-cheek it doesn't preclude people from donating anonymously through uh, if they really, really want to be philanthropic and don't want the credit and you don't know who it is. We haven't seen that happen because uh, businessmen like their tax credits and like to be able to brag about what, who they're supporting. But, you know, if, if people are genuinely philanthropic and in our Islamic faith, that if you give money anonymously, it's worth more than if you give it publicly. And so I think, you know, we say this as a joke, but I think there is that kind of cult, you know, there is the culture of wanting to be seen to be supporting something. And that makes it very dubious for everyone, for everyone involved. And, to be absolutely clear, we haven't had any anonymous <laughs> donations of any significant nature, but you know, it's a good, it's a good uh, model. I think we can put out there. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think with that, we'll probably wrap up the session now. Um, and actually, this provides us with a good uh, segue uh, to announce that the, the the idea with this webinar, with this web conference today, was actually that this would be one of two, with a second one to be organized at a later date, also with um, our partner, Brookings Doha Center on uh, the ecosystem for transitional justice and for diaspora mobilization. So the types of allies um, and other types of organizations and other types of frameworks that are necessary to have in place so that these diaspora mobilization efforts can succeed in getting to accountability. So that will be coming at a later date. Please do check in with us about this and see when this can come. Um, I don't know, Noha, if you would like to maybe say a concluding word. Um, Thank you, everyone. I mean, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, there's, you know, I and I really appreciate that you've shared both personal and professional stories. Um, 
that I myself identify with as well. And um, uh, I think that, you know, despite the, the challenges and the obstacles, um, I think that today's discussion confirms even more that um, there are some really great opportunities being created by people like yourselves and, um, and others in the diaspora, and that it's not all doom and gloom. Although, I don't know, Ahmed, about the Egyptian case. <laughs> we can have a separate conversation about that. But, um, but no, I'm, uh, jokes aside, I think that um, uh, I feel even more sort of optimistic, if I can say that, um, following today's discussion about the trajectory of the work of new Arab diasporas in transitional justice. So thank you. Thank you all.